Well, now, I'm standing in the London borough of Islington, which is often caricatured as the home of middle-class left-wing Labour. From this weekend, it's likely to be not just the home, but the political base of the Labour leader. Jeremy Corbyn is here in his constituency tonight. He's in the hall behind me, taking part in the final rally of the party leadership campaign. And we'll hear from him in a few moments. But there are no votes left to win. Polling closed at noon today amid a continuing row over the party's failure to provide election slips for all those eligible to vote, as our political correspondent Michael Crick now reports. On the shore of the Thames, just up from Westminster this month, four horsemen in The Rising Tide, a work by the underwater sculptor Jason DeCares Taylor. What began as a three-horse race suddenly became a four-horse contest when Jeremy Corbyn joined the fray as a 200 to 1 outsider. And now Mr Corbyn looks like creating the biggest upset in any leadership election in British political history. Across the river, the MI5 crest flutters over the Secret Service HQ. As inside, no doubt, they've been dusting down the Corbyn files, or maybe burning them. Andy Burnham wasn't even campaigning today, but this morning, before voting even closed, another of Corbyn's rivals, Liz Kendall, seemed to concede defeat. When the public is crying out for politicians to say what they mean and mean what they say, I cannot serve on a Labour front bench if Jeremy Corbyn is leader. But I will continue to serve my party and the people of Leicester West. So if it's time for being frank, what does she think of Corbyn now? I don't think he'll be the next, uh, uh, you know, he's going to be the right person to be leader of the party. I don't think he's going to win a general election, but I'm always going to campaign for the you Labour Party. You think he will be leader see. at the time of the next election? Let us see what I have no idea. Honestly, the honest Do you think it's possible he'll no be idea. deposed? I have no idea. Do you support him being deposed? No. If he wins the election, he would have to have the mandate that, you know, he'll have a mandate. But there will be MPs plotting away. Well, I'm not going to be, I have no idea, and I certainly wouldn't be part of that. So if somebody came to you with a, a, a letter and said, no. I'm calling on his resignation, no. you wouldn't sign it? You no, wouldn't. I'm not. No, I'm, you know, I think whoever wins this election will have a mandate. I don't For think there should be any talk of coups, elections or plots. Yvette Cooper also says she won't serve under Corbyn. Nonetheless... Well, the party does have to come together now. Whichever of us is elected as leader, that is really important. And that's something that I really want to do. It's why I'm feeling optimistic about Saturday's result as a result of the great campaigning that we've had. The result will be declared at the Queen Elizabeth Conference Centre late on Saturday morning. 554,000 people had votes after 4,500 were purged for not having Labour's aims and values. Mostly Greens, we're told. As soon as voting stopped at 12 o'clock today, I hear, the call started going out from the Corbyn camp, sounding out Labour MPs as to whether they'd be willing to serve in the Corbyn team. Leader of the opposition, it said, is the hardest job in politics. And no leader of a political party since Winston Churchill has had more time as an MP than Jeremy Corbyn. Yet, paradoxically, no leader of the opposition has had so little decision-making experience. Michael Crick, Channel 4 News, Westminster. Which is where Jeremy Corbyn has spent some 32 years sitting on Parliament's back benches. Even just a few months ago, he seemed certain to stay there, a mild-mannered but staunch champion of left-wing causes that even the Labour Party didn't appear to have much time for. So how come he now stands on the brink of power? Jeremy Corbyn hasn't changed, so what's happened to the Labour Party? Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, has been investigating. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Hey, can you join me to welcome Jeremy? Yes, we can! Yes, we can! Politics has been ambushed by a political surge. At its centre, a man who is the very opposite of everything a modern TV age political leader is supposed to be. What the party is doing now is turning the page once and for all on the Blair years. I'm accused of being a 1980s throwback. I was in this hall in, the in 1984, standing alongside the miners 
defending the mining industry and the miners. He's a purist and so he's very, um, he's always been the same and I think that's what people like about him. I think he has been spent 32 years on the margins of the Labour Party and the margins of British politics. Throughout his years as a Labour MP, he's often been the man standing at the edge of the picture or behind the better known left wing firebrands. Yeah, right. Uh, he, he is always at the back. It was, it was always Ben or Dennis Skinner and the rest of them, but not Jeremy. Jeremy's always the quiet one. Jeremy's not a noisy sort of fellow. He's very quiet, very unassuming. You, you wouldn't think he's had leadership material, but by God, I hope he has. The MP for Islington North is ending his campaign in the seat where 30 years ago his allies on the council trialled his political approach. Back in the left's 1980s heyday, this bust of Lenin sat in Labour-run Islington Council's offices. It's now in the local museum. If Labour elects Jeremy Corbyn this Saturday, he'll be the most left-wing leader in living memory. Some opponents say he'll usher in a period of purges and central control. But one MP who knows him well says He's a much gentler figure, a sitcom revolutionary, more wolfy than Lenin. Power to the people! Some around Jeremy Corbyn say he'll have to toughen up to survive and menace his opponents in the party to entrench the shift to the left. But how did he get to this point? A rebel on the brink of becoming leader. We must do more to involve members of the public in our decision making. For many, the story starts with Ed Miliband's new leadership election rules, cobbled together on the defensive and in haste two years ago, over a weekend of panicked meetings at his North London home. There will be a whole new type of participant who could take part in the election of a Labour leader in return for £3 and a click on the internet. The main thing is it's a new system. It's a one-person, one-vote system, and that's what's made the huge difference. Jeremy Corbyn's opponents say the rules allowed outsiders to charge into the election process and alter the balance of opinion. Ed Miliband's allies say it wasn't the reforms that were at fault. People in the mainstream of the Labour Party who are seeking to blame these party reforms or blame Ed Miliband need to actually look in the mirror if they want to know who to blame. They could have recruited more members themselves. These reforms are open to everybody to go out and sign people up for the Labour Party. They have to ask themselves why they've spent many of the last months whining about the process rather than recruiting people with the same effectiveness that Jeremy Corbyn has. Another key milestone moment happened in a small room here on the 3rd of June, just off Westminster Hall. A small room was all that was needed for the meeting of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, the most left-wing Labour MPs in the Parliamentary Party. They decided they wanted to run a candidate in the election race. They weren't sure they'd get 35 MPs to nominate that candidate as the rules required. They weren't even sure which one of them they'd try and put into the race. We decided we really had to have a candidate. We went round the table. I remember saying, I did it last time. And finally we got to Jeremy. Finally? Yeah. I think it was a persuasion argument to get Jeremy to stand, basically. Because no one else would. No, nobody else would. You know, Jeremy, go and have a go. Get on the, get on the hustlings and... Your I'm turn. It's your, your turn. turn. Yeah. You've been here long yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And nobody thought it would end up like this. Nobody. Not even Jeremy. Nobody. Your running surprised many. Had you been mulling it over for a while? We had a discussion amongst uh, MPs of the Labour Party who were anti-austerity and decided that it was a good idea to uh, put a candidate up who was uh, prepared to take that position. In that same spirit, widening the discussion, some Labour MPs critical of Jeremy Corbyn lent him their votes to get him nominated. They've faced a lot of abuse ever since. Your old allies in the centre, the centre right of the party would say, you, you, you're one of us, you made a massive mistake. You created the Corbyn leadership. You could say it's a, um, a, a classic mistake, or you could say what it's done is brought to a, um, to a point of crisis, that we were, how poverty stricken we were in ideas to counter Jeremy. In July, Harriet Harman said Labour MPs should abstain on Tory welfare reforms. All the candidates, except Jeremy Corbyn, rode in behind the decision. I wasn't prepared to lead a rebellion out of the shadow cabinet and plunge our party into civil war. It allowed Jeremy Corbyn's campaign to paint the other three candidates as much of a muchness and helped to propel him to front-runner. 
the rank outsider now potentially on the brink of leadership. I'm hoping Jeremy can stand firm and make it, but he hasn't, he hasn't got the Parliamentary Labour Party on his side. And he's not uh, run much in his life, has he? He hasn't, and he hasn't been, he hasn't been the, uh, in the front bench uh, He hasn't been before. tested like some people. He hasn't people. been tested. So he's got a job on his hands. We're going to wish him all the best and we're going to be supporting him. But I tell you what, there's, there's a lot out there and the Labour Party, Parliamentary Labour Party, will be sticking the knife in his back. From the background into the spotlight, the token lefty slipped into the race to broaden the debate. May as far as the Labour electorate is concerned, have won it. Gary Gibbon. Well, now, just before the Jeremy Corbyn rally started in the hall just behind me, I spoke to him and asked him the burning question. Is he scared at the prospect of leading the Labour Party? Well, it's a huge responsibility and there's huge issues coming up. I absolutely get and recognise and understand that. And there no, but is you look at a... yourself in the mirror and you say, Jeremy... I mean, this is something, this is an out-of-body experience. I look myself in the mirror and think I've spent my whole life campaigning on political issues. I've spent my whole life in the Labour Party. I've been put forward to this position. We've discussed all this with thousands of people. And there is, if we're successful, there's a huge responsibility. If we're not successful, there's a huge responsibility because the Labour Party is now the biggest membership it's been for many, many decades. Know, there's I huge things there. I asked you whether you were a little bit scared. I mean, that's a personal question, but it would be quite natural if you were. I'm very well aware of the responsibility. Scared, no. Really? I mean, you came here on your bicycle on Sunday. You could find yourself with special branch protection, a car, and a salary of £135,560. All those things are up for discussion on <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> do, we, do we get special branch bicycles? Well, you're a cyclist. Well, I am, <laughs> but I, the, the leader of the opposition has, has a lot of stuff to do. He'll need a car. Yes, sure. Well, we'll see about all that on Sunday. Have you thought about things like of that? Of course I've thought about all of those things. I've thought about the importance of doing the job, the importance of representing the party across the whole of the country, the importance of the parliamentary work, and the importance of representing my constituency. All those things have to be balanced. And also the importance of having a moderately normal life. How are you going to bind the uh, campaign that you fought with the unity of the Labour Party? Well, the campaign we fought has uh, brought a lot of people into the party. A lot of people maybe came into the party anyway. Uh, I think there are many older people who've come back who went away from Labour after the Iraq war. There are many younger people who were written off as being non-political, but in reality were turned off by the style of politics and are very open to this sort of ideas we put forward, as I said, on economic issues, but also on environmental issues, social issues, the way we do arts policy, all these things in Britain today. And I found, interestingly, the response is much the same in all parts of the country. For example, you've yeah, got a you huge see, you're meeting... You're talking about people who have come in new to the party, but of course there are people who have been in the party a long time and sitting in the House of Commons quite a long time. I mean, how are you going to bring people together, or does that not really matter? It does matter, and I've had many discussions with colleagues in Parliament over the past few days. There are many there who do not agree with many of the ideas that I put forward. I fully understand that. They also understand that whoever is elected the leader, and we don't know who it's going to be, has a mandate that has come from the widest franchise there's ever been for a Labour Party election. So there's going to have to be some quite serious discussions about the way we do our economic policy and a number of other things. That is surely good for the party. And uh, at the end of the day, they're all Labour MPs. They've all been selected and elected by the Labour Party and by the public. So I think we're going to... You, you, you'll be surprised how much we're going to achieve. Well, and if it happens, can you build a shadow cabinet? Are you confident that you can find the people to work with you? Extremely confident, yes. I've had many discussions with people already about how we're going to take this thing forward. You've got a shadow foreign secretary in your head, a shadow chancellor. I mean, these, there's, these lots things... of, there's lots of things in my head, but I don't think it'd be a good idea to tell you what they all are now. No, no, but they are in your head. Of course, there's lots of things in my head, including that. Because a lot of people are sort of making out that in the end this has been a, an extraordinary political campaign, but can it lead to a coherent leadership of the Labour Party? It's got to lead to a coherent leadership. If the election goes one way, if it goes the other way, then there's a 
slightly different set of circumstances. But yes, this is real enthusiasm by ordinary people wanting something different. And that is surely what's exciting. And they're not all young, they're not all old, they're all ages, they're all ethnic groups, all faiths. It's a kind of amazing sense of um, popular coalition, if you like. You, you're a man who's lived an organic North London life. You, you, you've had a, a work-life balance, ride a bike, you, you're a normal human being. But after Sunday, if you win, you'll be suddenly the possession of a political process. But I'll still be a normal human being. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. Welcome back to Islington in North London. I was brought up in no uncertain terms to hate Tories, the frank words of the newly elected Labour MP, Jess Phillips. But to win a general election, Labour needs to regain many thousands of people who voted Conservative at the last election, particularly in the South. One seat which Labour held during the Blair Brown years was Wandsdyke in Somerset. Redrawn as North East Somerset in 2010, it fell to the Conservative Jacob Rees-Mogg. So would a Corbyn-led Labour Party be able to reclaim the seat? We took Jess Phillips down to Somerset to take a tour of the constituency with the MP himself. It's really lovely to be in uh, this bit of Somerset. It is completely different to anywhere I uh, come from and my constituency couldn't be any more different. You are looking incredibly dapper, sir. It's just natural. It's just yeah. natural. You're just a natural. That's what you get in North East Somerset. Oh, is yeah. it? Oh, OK. Yeah. The reason I think it's important that I come here is because if the Labour Party is ever going to win a general election again, we have to win seats like this that we have won before and understand what went wrong for us in, in the towns and the, and the countryside. I was raised in, in no uncertain terms to hate Tories. Oh, OK. <laughs> I mean, like, hate, like, it's right. a swear word. It's so a swear you're, word you're, in you're, my you're, you're, you're all right in the car. <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, my father would have been happy if I'd married anyone. Had I married a Tory... You'd have been... Well, you'd that, have been disinherited anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, just inheritance. Leave inheritance. <laughs> that would have been completely anathema. <laughs> I did vote Conservative. Don't worry, I'm not a fan. <laughs> well, but thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's fine. So the Labour Party has to do that now talk to those people's they aspirations. Have, they have to talk to people with aspirations, yeah. yeah. At the moment, in the Labour Party, obviously, we're going through a big uh, change and electing a new leader. I'm and a bit worried about that. You're a bit worried. In what way are you worried? Well, I think uh, Jeremy's a bit too far to the left. Hey, you're quaking Coburn's going to get in, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you, are you a Corbyn man? Well... It'd be nice to see a bit of opposition. Oh, I see what you're saying, I see what you're saying. What's happening at the moment with Jeremy Corbyn uh, will make a big difference. You think it'll make you want to vote Labour? Possibly. Or... And so you work in the NHS? Yeah. And um, obviously the Labour Party in the last election talked about the NHS near constantly, it seemed to me, and that didn't yeah, appeal to you. so did Conservatives as well. OK. So. Mr Cameron promised to raise the inheritance tax level. OK. And a lot of people, before it was only very wealthy people that went into that band, yes. but now a lot of just ordinary Normal people, people yeah. have, have hit Me. that band, yeah. I think it's very good if Jeremy Corbyn gets in. Why is that? Because uh, they'll never be elected in my lifetime, I suspect. What, the Labour Party? The Labour Party. Well, if he does get in, I should imagine if he, they didn't get elected, he wouldn't last more than five years. I hope you've got more than five years of your lifetime left. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I, I hope so, sir. So do I. It's very interesting what people were saying, because we hadn't set them up to say things. No. <laughs> but they were saying exactly, exactly. what... That, that Labour wasn't appealing to people with aspiration. Yes, and and yeah. one man said it absolutely directly, using those words. Yeah. The next lady basically said that without that terminology. The same kids who grew up on the same estates in my constituency where my parents grew up. I, I, I'm not entirely sure that they're going to end up being professors of astrophysics like my uncle um, is and he's from, you know, a prefab on the council right. estate. But of course to go to your school, you don't have to be clever, you just have to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> Surely. Or is there a test? I don't know. There might no, well there, be a test. There, 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 there is a test. I mean, I don't think I'd get into Eton anymore, because oh, no. when I was there, you, you could get in as long as your parents could pay the fees. And that is, you do have to be clever. Oh, you do have to be clever You do now, oh, but right, you didn't okay. when I was there. When I was there, it was <laughs> well, easy. They let anybody in when what, I was what there. What a convenience. That's how I got there. 
<laughs> Where are we going, Daddy? We're going to a place called Magna. True Magna. True Magna. I think it won the Sunday Times uh, Most Attractive Village in the oh. Country contest a couple of years ago. I ima imagine you don't have much of a methadone outreach programme in True Magna. Uh, heroin addicts. No, so, not no. so much. They're very expensive. Yeah. You have to do it abroad and you have to look at yes, like, yes, I agree. Like, massive oh, oh. mansions. My father was the same. He would always look <laughs> at always, you wherever have to. we were. Wherever and we and were. That, is, that is truly aspirational, yeah. isn't it? I used to go and stay in one Lawrence Road. Yes, um, which yes. is uh, where Nanny was born. Yes, when you yes. say Nanny, you don't mean your mum's mum. I don't. I mean no, Nanny, yeah, who Nanny. has yeah. looked after the family oh. for 50 years oh. come oh. September. Like the dog in yes. Peter Pan. Do you want to hold my hand? Because we'll get across. I think we can get across for this lorry. Yeah. We don't want to create two by elections, <laughs> do we? <laughs> so, do you think that the Labour Party could ever win in this area? Why well, vote for them, Yay! Uh, I knew you looked sane. I think that nationalising the railway is, is something Definitely. that... Uh, yeah, that's a... That's a, a big that's tick a for big you. Big tick around here, so, yeah. OK, so around yeah. here, you think nationalising things would be a big tick. That's really interesting. So, on with Preston soldiers. The next lead eight. Um, it's a contentious subject. Oh, I'm supporting Yvette Cooper. I think she has the best chance of winning the next election. Also, as a feminist, I will look around if it's declared that two men have won the leadership and deputy leadership. Whether they're great, whether they're brilliant, but I will feel a little bit less like the Labour Party's for me. And if the Tories have done it, why can't we do it? The big argument that Jeremy Corbyn is this brand new, isn't he all singing, all dancing, could have changed the world. He's a white man from London. Yes. <laughs> I mean... Who's been in Parliament for 30 years. For 30 years, years and has he... never had another job. Isn't this the thing we've all been saying for ages that we didn't like? You'd serve under him. You're not one of those who wouldn't serve no, under him. No, I would from... serve under him. It's, it's very difficult to basically... And if you won by a huge amount, I, you know, it's like me slapping the face of the activists who help get me where I am to say that they're all wrong and they're all stupid. It completely mystifies me that Liz Kendall isn't way ahead, that she seems to me to be the one who has the ability to appeal to the type of person that Tony Blair appealed to. Liz Kendall, um, it, in my opinion, harps back to the past just as much as um, Jeremy Corbyn does. It's just a more recent past. Well, this is uh, Radstock. Radstock was the coal mining centre, really, of North East Somerset. It was the heart, the beating heart of the Labour Party with the Working Men's Club. I was always Labour all my life. Oh, because my grandfather was Labour, uh, and my father was Labour, and my father was a coal miner. So you used to be a Labour man. You are a traditional yeah. Labour man. In the yeah. 80s, you were a Labour man. Yeah. In the 90s, you were a Labour man. Yeah, yeah. And Labour all my life. So you've yeah. been Labour no, all your life. So no. how do you feel about the Labour leadership? I'm not, been, not very happy with Corin. So you don't want it to be Jeremy no, Corbyn, no, even though you are, uh, you know, but you're a working left. class I'm man from a mining but town. Extreme, but not extreme left. I, I can't see him being able to balance the books. I'm sure Jeremy Corbyn is a, is a lovely, great, principled man. By all accounts, he's a very, very nice man, but I don't think he can win in places like this. But do you really want to win in places like this, or...? Does the socialist in you want to maintain a purity that is so fine and spotless that appealing to Tories is a bit of a sellout? If yeah. I could have a pure socialist ideology and win in seats like this, you can bet your bottom dollar I would take that chance. But I'm a pragmatist and that's just simply not going to happen. But if I could, you know, I, I could nationalise every single inch of this place, I would. But in the meantime, you'll be a Blairite. <laughs> well, welcome back to Jeremy Corbyn's uh, constituency in North London. Uh, even now, the rally is continuing. We're certainly with one of his very key supporters, the uh, radical left-wing union leader from Unite, Len McCluskey. But I'm joined now by supporters of all four candidates for the leadership. Jade Azim, who's uh, studying politics at Durham University. She's an Andy Burnham supporter. Ella Krein is studying classics at Oxford and is a supporter of Liz Kendall. Andrea Campos-Vigoro, 
who's recently graduated, has just started her first job working in PR. She backs Yvette Cooper and Shelley Asquith, vice president of the National Union of Students, is a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. And I suppose what I want to know is, this is we talked to you, three of you anyway, um, when this all started two months ago, and you decided who you were backing. Yeah. Have you wavered? I'm not going to ask Shelley at the moment because mm -hmm. she's a different coach. She's back in Corbyn. Mm -hmm. What about you, Andrew? No, I think it was always a bet for me. She's amazing. She's an incredible woman. She's always inspired me with her career. And when she ran, I knew that I was going to back her. And she didn't disappoint you in the campaign at all? No, she's been amazing. Liz Kendall. I have to say her bravery and integrity throughout has really kept me supporting her. Um, and I want to win and beat the Tories in 2020, and I think the best way to do that is to support And Jade, Andy Burnham, you never veered off him? I never veered on my first preference, because I was always a fan of Andy during the last parliament. But my second preference actually did waver between uh, either Jeremy or Yvette, and I ended up going with Yvette. Did, any of you vote for, did either of you vote for Jeremy Corbyn as a second? No. Who did you vote for? Liz. Uh-huh, and? Yvette. Right, very interesting. Now, let's get to Jeremy Corbyn. Has he surprised you? He surprised me in the level of in the number of people that he's managed to galvanise, you know, not just in the Labour Party, but the people that have joined the Labour Party and outside of it as well. The types of people that are coming to the rallies, the halls that we're packing out and the phone banks as well. It is amazing. What do you think he's done, though? Has he tapped into a residual uber-left, uh, you know, disenfranchised people who've never been part of really of the political discourse and he suddenly captured them and brought them around or are they mainstream people? I think there's a level of disenfranchisement of the types of people that are coming into the Corbyn campaign, are coming into the Labour Party because of his campaign. I don't think it's about uber left, I think it's a plethora of different people, people I don't necessarily agree with on everything, that are coming around and supporting him. And, and, and what are your feelings about whether, whether people will split? I mean, will you desert the Labour Party if Jeremy Corbyn wins? No, absolutely not. No? No. 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 Will you work for him? I would. I will still come to campaign. I'll campaign in 2020 for a Labour government. I'll be on the doorstep and I'll be fighting for a Labour government because at the end of the day, it's all about the Labour values and we all want to social equality and justice. What would be the thing which would worry you most if he wins? I'd be concerned that our economic policies wouldn't win trust with the public and that foreign policy might isolate us from the rest of the world. He, he is anti-European effectively, isn't he? It yes. seems that way, and NATO as well. Really um, are you pro-European? Yes. You? Yes. You? I'm... It's not Europe that worries me. It's just that I know that the press is going to come down hard on his past associations, even if I don't necessarily agree that they're that bad. But we live in a new world. I mean, the press doesn't matter as much as it ever did, does it? It did with Ed. We always thought that Ed Milvan would be able to overcome the powers that be, and he didn't. And I feel like the press had a massive influence on the election. How do you feel the social network has responded to this campaign? I mean, have you been very active on the social network? In terms of social media, yeah, yeah. yeah. amazing. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's massively kicked off, and I think Corbyn has actually led on that. He's had a very, you know, a, a huge social presence on, on social media, and lots of young people getting involved in that as well. Who's given him the presence? Because I don't suppose he was a Facebooker before all this started. Actually, he was. I've been was I've it? been friends with him on Facebook for a while, yeah, and, and tweeting as well. But actually, sounds a lot, quite intimate. A lot of it's been <laughs> set up by grassroots, setting up their own pages, their own events, and things like that. So. Uh, you know, it's not all come from Corbyn, it's come from people that are getting just involved and, and enthusiastic. And has Facebook been the, the, the main transmission tool, do you think? I think Facebook and Twitter, Twitter like, Twitter. yeah, I think you can't Twitter? post a status on Facebook without about 20 people, for, like, writing on it and getting involved in debates. And Twitter is also just such a quick platform because it just means that people can communicate really quickly and it just gets messages out there. Can Labour win the next general election? Yes, but it's an incredible mountain to climb and it depends on how we expose this government and its flaws, basically. Do, do you think, for example, about how a Jeremy Corbyn leadership might manage to do things in Scotland, for example, win yeah. some seats back? I don't, I don't sadly think that that's going to be a quick process, whoever the leader is. Don't yeah. you think the only way to beat the SNP would be from the left? In a way, but at no. the same time, we also we won the 2001 and the 2005 general election without winning Scotland, and I think that our key concerns are the swing seats that we lost and the ones that we were meant to win in 2015.
Jeremy will make huge gains in Scotland, I think. The way that the SNP won was by building a movement, which is what Jeremy is doing, and that the types of policies they talked about, which were anti-austerity, anti-strident, are the things that he's talking about. But we can't just win in Scotland. We have to be talking to disenfranchised people, people I who voted UKIP. When, I think Scotland was about nationalism more yeah. than it was about left-wing politics. Yeah. It's also when well, you look at Glasgow, it's got massive majorities now. It's the West that we should really focus on. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but I would say the Labour Party is jolly lucky to have four members like you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> for, you, now, you. political editor Gary Gibbon is here. Gary, uh, he told us, Jeremy Corbyn told us here earlier, he's been talking to colleagues. Uh, is he building a shadow cabinet? He's ringing them up and asking them if they'd be willing to serve under him. And are him. they? And some of them are saying yes, and some of them are holding their breath. I dare say some of them uh, have, have already said no publicly, so he's not bothering with them. Interestingly, I've, I've just heard that uh, uh, Len McCluskey, who's just been in there uh, speaking, the United General Secretary, has actually had a little word in uh, Jeremy Corbyn's ear as well. And this has been uh, cheesing off some people around him. He's been suggesting that Andy Burnham should be Shadow Chancellor, when some people around Jeremy Corbyn, maybe Jeremy Corbyn himself, had rather hoped it would be his uh, long-time political partner, as it were, the inseparable twin John McDonnell. So already something there. We'll, we'll get a few ears uh, wagging. The idea that the General Secretary is trying to uh, say who should and shouldn't be in the Shadow Cabinet. I tackled him on the car, the salary and the rest. He said I've been thinking about them, but uh, we'll see if there will be some changes. There will be uh, changes. Labour Party is already preparing for them. Conferences in two weeks. He's got very little time to unveil stuff. And as far as I know, there's no great white board covered in post-its with a plan for the first hundred days. This is very much work in progress. We've both seen him. He's extraordinarily relaxed. Very. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they love that in there. There was a cheer at the beginning of the rally when they saw a picture of him as worst-dressed MP in an appalling corduroy jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Gibbon.